I'm Dr. Barbara Lando and thank JSpace Canada and our Next Generation Committee for the honor of welcoming our speakers and moderator who share a passion for justice and equality. Our topic touches the heart of annexation. Fundamentally, it's about relationships, respect, and justice. How do we treat our neighbors? How do we want to be treated? The international response to the death of George Floyd is shining a light on systemic racism and the treatment of minority communities. It is the virus that underlies abuse of power, and it is part of our discussion about the corrosive impact of annexation. Our distinguished guests, Alon Liel, a former Israeli ambassador to South Africa and a former director general of the Israeli Foreign Ministry, and Mohammed Darwashi, director of Gavat Aviva's Center for Equality and Shared Society, set the bar for how best to create a real partnership based on mutual respect and cooperation. I met Alon years ago but in 2016, as part of Premier uh, Kathleen Wynne's trade mission, I asked Alon to be my partner in convening a shared society meeting at the Hand in Hand School in Jerusalem. 20 organizations came together in a spirit of cooperation and friendship. It was a transformative shared society meeting, and of course, Gavat Aviva was a participant. On my return, with our President Karen Mock's enthusiastic support, we created the JSpace Canada Shared Society Committee, bringing together leaders of various progressive Zionist organizations. In 2018, I joined Alon's CISO campaign, Save Israel and Stop the Occupation. Well, that job is not yet done. Alon's middle name is Determination. So, with Alon at the helm, in 2019, we created J-Link, a worldwide network of progressive Jewish organizations to advocate for the values that J-Space Canada stands for, two states, democracy and human rights. Our first task is opposing the proposed annexation. Mohammed has been more than an advocate for equality. He has created facts on the ground. For example, in 2009, he helped draft Israel's co uh, coexistence education policy and his shared society programs bring together children of all ages and their parents to humanize, befriend, and confront difficult issues together. Mohammed's Shared Society is the home of many heartwarming projects, including my favorite, Heart to Heart Campers and Their Parents. They model partnership as a visible reality. Each time I visit Gavad Haviva, I think this is the Israel that I admire. The price of annexation is not just continuing conflict and dollars. It is a very human cost. The loss of hope and a shared vision of what the future should be. I leave it to Alon and Mohammed to share their perspective as Israeli citizens and as parents and grandparents. What story will they tell their children and grandchildren about the impact of annexation on future Jewish-Palestinian relationships. I now pass the baton to Nora Gold, a prize-winning author and the founder and editor of the literary journal Jewish Fiction Net. The Canadian progressive Jewish community owes Nora a debt. She is the founder of JSpace Canada and co-founder of the New Israel Fund in Canada and of Canadian Friends of Gavat Aviva. Thank you and you're in for a treat. Thank you so much, Barbara, for your lovely words of welcome and your introductions, and also for very generously sponsoring the Next Generation webinar series of which this is a part. Thank you, Barbara. 
Warm thanks also to Karen Mock and Jordan Devon for inviting me to moderate this session. It's an honor. And last but not least, thanks very much to all of you who are joining us for this event on Zoom. We're very glad you're with us. For those of you who are new to JSpace Canada, JSpace Canada is an all volunteer, nonpartisan, progressive Jewish organization. We serve as a voice of moderation in Canada and regarding Israel. We oppose any claims that question Israel's right to exist, and we oppose the BDS movement. At the same time, we consider the annexation of settlements in the West Bank an obstacle to peace and a threat to Israel's security. We support a negotiated settlement to the Israel-Palestine conflict that is guided by the principles of mutual recognition and respect. You can read more about us on our website and we invite you to join us in our important work. During this webinar, I will be asking questions of Alon Liel and Mohammed Darausha. We are having some technical problems, which is why you are not able to see them yet, but people are working behind the scenes and hopefully they will be with us in a moment. During this webinar, uh, I will be asking questions of Alon and Mohammed, uh, and it's a great honor to have them both here. They're both major figures in their fields. And at the end, we will have 10 minutes for Q&A with the audience, that means you. Uh, we have disabled the chat button at the bottom, but the Q&A button is open. So if you would like to ask a question, at the end, uh, or rather for me to ask the question on your behalf, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we can't promise, of course, to get to all of the questions that are asked, but we will do the best we can with the time available. With no further ado, uh, to our topic, the threat of annexation and the future of Arab-Jewish partnership. Um, I think I will just throw out a couple of sentences to provide the general context for this conversation. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has repeatedly declared his intention to annex up to 30% of the disputed West Bank, potentially covering all of the settlements and the Jordan Valley area starting on July 1st, which is just two and a half weeks from now, subject to the approval of the Americans. It now seems that Netanyahu is going to begin with the annexation of three West Bank blocks, Malaya Dumim, Ariel, and Gush Etzion. It's still a question, though, whether he's going to declare Israeli sovereignty over all of the West Bank land allocated to Israel under the Trump administration's so-called Peace to Prosperity proposal, which was unveiled at the White House in January 2020. In either case, Netanyahu's intent to annex has elicited complex reactions, including major objections, uh, both within Israel and in the international community. So we look forward very much to hearing from our speakers, Alon and Mohammed, um, who I hope are on the line. Are they on the line now? Okay. The format that we were going to begin with, as Mohammed knows, but our, our guests did not know, um, I am going to, uh, I, the plan was to ask Mohammed and Alon alternately uh, several questions each. Uh, I will just uh, converse with Mohammed until uh, Alon joins us. So, Mohammed, first I'll start with the question that uh, was going to be sort of an opportunity for opening remarks for both you and Alon uh, with the same question. And that is, mm -hmm. what is it about the current threat of annexation that concerns you the most and why? Please. Well, I think that the first thing is that uh, it's shaking up uh, the, the concept of two states. Uh, until, I mean, for the last 70 some years, everyone thought that uh, the only way to uh, progress was the two-state solution, and actually, that was the alternative for the one-state solution. Mm -hmm. And uh, mean, and this process, this uh, uh, annexation, 
comes and in a way kills the viability of the potentially creating a Palestinian state, which means that the two-state solution is out and we are stuck with one of two alternatives, either towards the one-state solution, which in my view might be ideologically nice, and especially for people that sit in the West in their comfort seats, uh, they think it's idealistic, they think in the principles of uh, civil rights and human rights and one person, one vote, in a nationalistic structure uh, where the Zionist movement sees the Jewish people as a people, as a nation that deserves a homeland, and the Palestinian people see themselves as a nation that also deserves self-determination and the homeland, uh, the annexation comes and actually kills these two alternatives, and it offers one of two options, as I said. Either the concept of one state that is definitely not going to be a state for all of its citizens. Uh, we are far from this concept of one person, one vote in a, a joint Palestinian-Israeli state, which means that the other second alternative will be a hierarchic state one which will uh, provide a, a special status for one ethnic group uh, over the uh, second ethnic group, which means that the Jewish people will be able to fulfill their aspirations uh, for a statehood and the national uh, self-determination. And the Palestinians will remain uh, secondary in their uh, social, political, uh, national status without the possibility of fulfilling their own aspiration, which is a recipe for continued uh, conflict. It means that the conflict, the Palestinians will not surrender their national will, <coughs> sorry, national will for statehood, which means that they have to go back to square one, which is restarting their struggle for Palestinian national uh, structure. Until now also, and that's a second problem with the annexation issue, until now, and especially since 1967, the two-state solution was built around the concept of two states on the 1967 borders. And uh, now the concept of 1967 borders is out, and uh, annexation is introducing, and actually the Trump plan, is uh, introducing a completely different map structure, mm -hmm. which takes away 30% of the Palestinian lands, inhabited lands, and offers the Palestinians some kind of a small compensation in uh, potentially, and not even, it's not part of the annexation deal. It offers potentially in a few years down the road, maybe they'll get some desert land that is not inhabitable and it's not a place for people to actually live in. And they end up be, being some kind of islands within, uh, uh, surrounded by Israeli military troops, which means that they are going to, the Palestinians are offered uh, to be uh, under siege all the time uh, without the pot potentially and the capacity of having their own self-determination and their own land that they can cultivate. And it seems that uh, uh, annexation is rewarding uh, occupation uh, that has lasted for so many years. It's rewarding it uh, with the complete ownership and takeover of Palestinian lands which says that the concept of justice and the concept of reconciliation and the concepts of uh, uh, peace agreements do not actually uh, apply to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And uh, when all those concepts are uh, demolished and uh, uh, smashed in, 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 in this way, uh, the annexation step means that we're starting a new stage and that new stage will be, as I said earlier, going to square one in Israeli-Palestinian confrontations over every inch of land. It's going to open the discussion not only about the West Bank and Gaza, it's going to open the discussion about Tel Aviv and about Haifa and about uh, uh, lands in, uh, inside. So if you can allow, if Israel allows itself to annex parts of the West Bank, why shouldn't the future Palestinian state think of taking the Galilee and go back to the partition plan of 1948? It's reshoveling every concept, every progress that was been accomplished towards a, a, a historic resolution of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And it says, let's go back to the partition plan of 1947. 
And uh, that's the, the annexation basically makes that, that kind of a problem. It says nothing that was accomplished in, in 72 years of accumulated negotiations, of accumulated knowledge, accumulated intellect uh, that leads towards a two-state solution. And uh, we're now starting a, a chaotic uh, uh, approach where the one that has the power can make the decisions. And currently it's Israel that has that power. And the Palestinians are saying, okay, so let's reshuffle the power structure. If that's the case, we might potentially start burning the ground all over the, uh, the, the, the region between the river, the Jordan River and uh, the Mediterranean Sea and open all of Palestine as a front because uh, no one wants to, uh, or Israel does not seem to want to go towards a two-state solution in 1967 borders. So it's, it's basically uh, taking us to a, a unknown uh, a territory, which is, I would say, quite known. And the known territory is square one conflict, a, a battle over everything. Uh, uh, everything is permitted, every demand is permitted. Uh, no regard to history, no regard to previous negotiations. Uh, looking at the Palestinians today as the weak party, and the Palestinians, as if, if they see themselves as the weak party, they're not going to engage in negotiations. Uh, they're going to wait until they gain more power. And that means we're stuck in a new cycle that might, of violence that might last 72 additional years. God forbid. Thank I you. believe we have a loan on the line. He can just uh, unmute himself, or if he's able to speak now. Alon, you're on the line. Mohammed, thank you for that excellent, succinct summary. Alon, are you now able to hear us? We don't hear you. All right. I, if, if I want to help him, uh, going through my computer, I couldn't get connected. I was able to connect through my phone, and the phone gives the, uh, the opportunity of unmuting yourself while the computer doesn't give that opportunity. So okay. maybe that could be helpful. Okay, if you heard that, Alon, I hope that helps. Uh, in the meantime, we can't hear Alon or see him. So uh, let's continue chatting, you and me, Mohammed. Um, so far, two of the reactions in the Palestinian community to the- I'm joining you through a computer, oh, it's working. Alon! Oh, Mohammed, that's Mohammed, welcome. Okay, we can see Mohammed, that's a great step forward, lovely. So happy to see you. Salam. All right, we will continue our dialogue, which hopefully will become a trialogue and then a community conversation. All right. Um, Mohammed, so far, two of the reactions in the Palestinian community to this annexation have been that the Palestinian prime minister vowed to declare independence if Israel annexes the West Bank, and the Palestinian Authority submitted a counterproposal to the American plan, which would provide for a demilitarized Palestine. Yet a recent article I read in Haaretz indicates that the Palestinian leadership is actually struggling to rally the public against annexation. In your view, what is the reaction to this annexation plan among Arab and Palestinian citizens of Israel? Among the politicians, of course, but also among the people themselves. <clears throat> well, many Palestinians uh, still don't believe that the annexation will actually take place. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, uh, you know, we have an idiom in Arabic. Uh, it's like a question. How did you know it's a lie? And the answer was, it was so big. And the concept of annexation, <laughs> it's such a huge uh, uh, issue that uh, most people, the average Palestinian people, do not really believe it's going to happen. They still think that it's a political gimmick. It's some kind of a pressure uh, a, a gimmick in order to put the Palestinians uh, into a situation that they feel that if they do not abide to come to the negotiations table, they're going to lose an additional 30% of their territory. And this might create, uh, undermine their strategic uh, interests uh, dramatically. Now that's, and I would say that would explain why the Palestinian uh, public is not actually active as of yet. I think that they, we will see them 
more active only if there will be practical steps on the ground. If the annexation will start developing on the ground, that's when we will probably see a Palestinian resistance to this move when they still, when they start feeling that their land is actually melting out of their, of their hands and that uh, the, the reality uh, is changing on the ground with new uh, set of walls and set of uh, barriers that uh, will actually make a future Palestinian temporary entity uh, as a Swiss cheese type of uh, uh, structure. Now, the Palestinian leadership did actually, uh, will uh, definitely apply for, uh, announce Palestinian statehood and request the UN recognition of the future Palestinian state as such. Uh, I think that will create a, a new uh, dynamic and new pressure on the international diplomatic arena. I think the Palestinians, uh, the Palestinian leadership will fight the diplomatic battle. They have refrained until now for applying uh, for the status of, of a state and declaring themselves a state, which means that many countries will recognize them. It's not just that the Palestinians will announce themselves a state. I do expect that many Arab countries, many European countries, actually Palestine is recognized by more countries than Israel. Uh, and they have more diplomatic relations than the state of Israel. The PLO and the Palestinian leadership has more diplomatic relations than the, the state of Israel. Wow. And they will probably try to translate that into kind of a statehood, which means that there will be significant legal battle uh, in the international arena. Uh, where the future Palestinian state will have extra capacity and power to take Israel to court, will be able to take uh, uh, the state of Israel uh, to, to international court uh, for exercising the occupation. As long as the uh, Palestinian authority is not an official body, it's not a state, it cannot sue the state of Israel in many international arenas. Mm -hmm. And uh, the occupation will become a, a, a legal liability uh, if the state of Israel is occupying an internationally recognized state. Mm -hmm. And uh, that means it's, it's going to become much more confrontational. Uh, the state of Israel will definitely move uh, uh, and escalate its opposition uh, to that uh, Palestinian state. Uh, that escalation uh, might mean that uh, some of the Palestinian leadership might be taken into custody, uh, that they might be put in some restrictions and restraints, uh, that uh, Palestinian uh, 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 diplomatic uh, statuses, in, uh, ministries, and the prime minister and the president uh, 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 offices might be demolished, uh, as, it, as there were some kind of incidents like that during the, uh, uh, the second intifada, mm -hmm. uh, which means that the Palestinian public will respond much, much more aggressively. I mean, this kind of act will definitely be met by an Israeli reaction. Uh, you know, Palestinian reaction will result with an Israeli reaction. And uh, basically, it's, it's, uh, the Palestinians are choosing confrontation. I mean, they're, they're not going to be sitting ducks, sitting ducks waiting for Israeli annexation just to, uh, to happen and operate and move forward without them taking action. Yes, they're... Their, their capacity is much, much less than the capacity of the State of Israel because their capacity to uh, uh, put troops in front of the Israeli troops that will come and uh, exercise annexation is limited, but uh, their capacity is going to be uh, in the diplomatic arena, uh, which, but, but ultimately that's going to motivate the Palestinian public on the ground uh, uh, to react for any counter Israeli measure that will happen. It's not, it's definitely not promising to be a, a nice, interesting atmosphere for the next uh, few years uh, to follow. And I don't think this is going to be a, a, an immediate one time event reaction. It's going to uh, ac start accumulating. Uh, the Palestinians will definitely choose a, a low intensity conflict uh, because they cannot choose a high intensity conflict, mm -hmm. and that low intensity conflict will probably mean you'll have a lot of Palestinian casualties. Uh, and uh, over time, the accumulation of casualties, uh, they hope, would hope this will embarrass uh, the international community and will embarrass Israel. 
Uh, and the question is, how many casualties will fall as a result of uh, this crazy act that uh, we're anticipating? Thank you, Muhammad. Very bleak picture and uh, realistic, I think. Mohammed, uh, another, another question for you. In recent weeks, there's been speculation about a possible merger between Merits and the Arab parties, the joint list, which would solidify a stronger presence on the Israeli left. Uh, can you comment on the likelihood of this happening and what the impact of it might be if it does? Nora, before, we, uh, before I start answering this question, let's try to analyze what actually happened over the last 20 years. Okay. Uh, Israeli, the Israeli left has uh, pretty much committed suicide. It started by the statement of uh, Ehud Barak in the year 2001, when he said there's no Palestinian partner to negotiate with. And uh, many Israelis started moving to the right or to the center uh, right, believing that uh, there's a deadlock on the, on the peace front. Uh, meanwhile, uh, the Arab citizens, the Arab community, started pulling out of Israeli Zionist political left parties, whether it was the Labour Party or Meretz. Uh, just to remind you, uh, just on, in 1999, almost 50% of the Arab citizens voted for Zionist left political parties. Mm -hmm. In the last elections, only 9% uh, of the Arab citizens voted for Zionist left political parties. Uh, but also many Israeli Jews de departed this left ship uh, and moved to more centrist uh, uh, political parties. Uh, in a way, what we, we witnessed two things. One is an in increase in the weight of the Arab political parties because more Arabs uh, immigrated from the Zionist left into the Arab political parties mm -hmm. and uh, more Jews immigrated from the Zionist left to the Zionist center. So it weakened the Zionist left in Israel. And uh, I think that this, this new balance of power where the Arab citizens are getting more independent status in this kind of potential partnership uh, uh, makes it a, a unique type of discussion. Mm -hmm. you know, I personally believe, and maybe this is not that much of a professional assessment, but a personal assessment. I person personally believe that, yes, there was a necessity uh, to reorganize and rebuild the Arab political independent political power through mm -hmm. the, joint, the joint Arab list. Mm -hmm. But this cannot be sustainable because to be effective, it has to, be, uh, it has to become part of a larger block of the Israeli left, the Arab citizens plus the Israeli uh, left in, inside the state of Israel. Now the left is so small that uh, it doesn't seem, and merits has become so small in this process that uh, their status in this kind of partnership is probably not the right weight. I mean, they are not, in, in the last elections, they were probably almost equal uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, they were with eight seats versus uh, 11 seats of the Arab political parties. Now it's 15 to three. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a huge, a thir 13 to three. It's yeah. a huge imbalance, mm -hmm. uh, which make, makes me assume that these types of negotiations are not going to go well because of this, huge imbalance, mm -hmm. but it is definitely a necessity. And the necessity can be answered uh, if uh, merits can bring in additional center left political parties, uh, because I don't think merits will agree to go into this kind of imbalance power. Merits, the, the, the polls indicate that they potentially can get eight seats in the next elections, uh, and that the joint list will get 15 seats. Separately, they can get potentially 23 seats. Mm -hmm. Jointly, polls are indicating that they'll get probably 24 seats. So there is no significant increase. Mm -hmm. I mean, no party can say we will be the, the ones that were going to make that significant increase. Mm -hmm. Now, the question would be, again, if Merit gathers more capacity within the Israeli Jewish left, and they might be able to attract a, a, couple, of more, a couple of people from a blue and white political party or from Yesh Atid political party uh, figures that can uh, bring Jewish voters with them and show that they can materialize that potential of eight seats, mm -hmm. then a potential partnership between 
13 to 8 is much more balanced. I mean, you can talk about a joint Jewish Arab political party. Mm -hmm. Today, with three seats, put them together with the 13 Arab seats from the joint Arab list, they will get lost. I mean, there will be three out of 16, and I don't think merits practically, politically, what we call real politic yeah. negotiations in Israel, merits will not go for this kind of partnership. The joint list actually would love to take merits this small, because they, <laughs> they think that yeah. they'll probably think that they can grow it yeah. in the future and they can raise uh, uh, their capacity in outreach in the Jewish community and attracting Jewish voters, but they're not going to be willing to pay the price for that. Uh, and that's why I don't think it's going to happen very soon. Okay, thank you. Um, another question for you. Um, Mohammed, how would you see this annexation affecting Jewish Arab relationships in the diaspora? For example, here in Canada. What advice do you have for concerned progressive Jewish groups in the diaspora, both in terms specifically of this annexation issue, but also more broadly for advancing positive Arab-Jewish relations? I would say there, there are three types of relations that we've experienced uh, between Jews and Arabs in Israel and in the diaspora. And we can uh, catalog them in three uh, categories. One, uh, we've been uh, going through narrative debate. Who's right, who's wrong, whose land is it? You know, they're Palestinian people, are Jews a nation or just a religion? We've been going through these narrative debates, uh, which I would say that most of us can agree to disagree uh, in. We can never reach uh, an agreement on this issue, mainly because the conflict is active. This kind of debate can be resolved only once you are post-conflict. Uh, during conflict, uh, it's, an, it's an exercise uh, that causes a lot of stomach ache, and it's an exercise that uh, ends with, okay, let's agree to disagree. And I would ask, expect that if the path of the, uh, the, the Arab and the Jewish groups that will be in the diaspora if their path is to continue the debate about annexation, it's going to be the same kind of uh, non-worthy exercise. And I think annexation, uh, if it happens, it's going to feed this more and more. We're going to see more of this kind of, of, of discussion. The second kind of relations we had, especially with the more progressive uh, Jewish and Arab groups, was what we call the uh, uh, the social contact theory. People that come for social cultural combia, uh, let's forget about the conflict, let's focus on the hummus and focus on uh, uh, cultural uh, activity, music. And you know, this is nice, but this doesn't get you anywhere. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's a, it does the humanization process, which I think is extremely important, uh, where we are able to see ourselves as, as each other as human beings and not just as political subjects mm -hmm. with whom we have a debate. So the humanization process is of extreme importance, but it, 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 because the scale is so small, it's not going to make tectonic shift. It's not going to move the ship of Arab-Jewish relations globally in any real direction. It's probably going to make a, focus, a nice impact in a local community in a certain neighborhood in Toronto or in a certain neighborhood in uh, San Francisco, but not a tectonic shift that might have an impact on the region. The third type of relations that we've been exper experiencing is what we call, you know, in conflict resolution, we call it the superordinate goal theory. It's basically discussions about uh, mutual interests and how can we find mutual interests, mm -hmm. whether it is how do we combat uh, anti-Semitism jointly, for example, in Europe, or how do we support a project that might promote good relations between Palestinians and Israelis on the ground in the region. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think this is still, this will continue to be valid because it doesn't matter what kind of impact the annexation issue uh, will take, alone is with us now. Uh, it doesn't matter what kind of impact alone, the annexation. Alone. Okay. <laughs> Welcome alone. Finally. Welcome, Alon. 
Okay, continue. Please finish, Mohammed, and then I will ask uh, Alon some questions. Yeah, uh, it's uh, the, the, it will definitely uh, the, this kind of the concept of building relations between Jews and Arabs to partner on actions and not just to uh, exhaust each other in dialogue, you know, just dialogue for the sake of dialogue, or not just to uh, uh, feel good type of uh, uh, interactions, but to focus more on mutual interests. I think that is the real building of islands of success in, in Jewish Arab relations. So I think that the impact of annexation might move us into this direction, might be able to make distinction between the narrative debate between the uh, social contact uh, this, uh, debate or dialogue uh, versus the mutual interests. I think that these uh, three types will be sharpened and uh, those that will go into the narrative debate, I think those kind of dialogue groups will break up very, very quickly mm -hmm. under the, the uh, umbrella uh, or under the cloud of the upcoming annexation that will create very strong tension in these type of discussions. Thank you very much, Mohammed. Alon, can you hear us? I was watching you since you started, but you ignored me all the time. Chas <laughs> v'chalila, <laughs> chas v'chalila. Alon, I was feeling for you. I saw you all the time, but nobody <laughs> noticed. Well, I'm delighted. Finally, we're all together, all three of us. Um, since Mohammed has just answered four questions in a row, we're going to give you the stage for the next while alone and start at what was the beginning in the plan. Um, welcome, welcome, first of all. Thank you. Um, please tell us what it is about the current threat of annexation that concerns you the most. We've heard, uh, we've heard Mohammed's response to this. That concerns you the most and why? So I heard, I heard Mohammed's response uh, about uh, losing the two states option, but I, I would widen it a little bit. First of all, I'm among those Israelis who, who feel very badly about what we do to the Palestinians. And we do it now for 53 years. And I think they've suffered enough. And instead of uh, easing the situation, we are increasing the suffering. And I, I know very well that most of the Israelis Jewish Israelis do not care, but I, I feel bad about it. I, I have a difficulty sleeping at night because of, of what we do to people who not only are neighbors, we see them every day. I live in the Jerusalem area. We work with them. And now with the, with the crisis, with the health crisis, many of them save lives of, of uh, Israeli, Israelis all the time. And uh, and I watch their suffering and I suffer myself. So first of all, I want to end my suffering. On the other level is that, that, that this is a mortal blow to Israel's democracy. Because as I know the Israelis and I was born here, studied here, went to the army here and served this country as a diplomat for over 30 years, we will not give them citizenship. And if we will not give them citizenship, this is a, a new type of nightmare, at least for me, that is mm -hmm. called apartheid. So, so the answer to your question, Nora, is that first of all, I can't see them suffer. Two, I don't, see, I don't want to see my children and grandchildren who are all in Israel living in an apartheid state. So, so this is, why I'm so worried. Alon, first of all, I, I'm moved by what you say and it's very close to my heart in terms of the pain that it causes you, me, and many like-minded people. And I'm interested, as you know, um, given that you were Israel's ambassador to South Africa, and you know that society very well, including through a relationship with Nelson Mandela. Um, I, I want to ask about the term apartheid. For example, um, Benjamin Pogrant, who's a South African born progressive Jew, who's been very active on the left for decades. He's always resisted what he and others call the A word. He, he, 
He has been very uh, clear and strong about the idea that Israel is not an apartheid state. But what he said recently in an interview at Haaretz was that if Netanyahu proceeds in this direction, uh, his exact words, if he goes ahead with his plan to unilaterally annex large parts of the West Bank, apparently without offering Israeli citizenship to the Palestinians who live in these areas, Israel will indeed turn into an apartheid state. And you apparently agree with that, Alon. Yeah, so first, Benjamin Pogrom is a friend for many years, and we both have many, many Mandela hours. And, and I appreciate what he did as a journalist uh, under apartheid. But in the last decade, we were arguing all the time. I, I said occupation, the occupation reached a level that it is apartheid especially since the separation of the two legal system, according to which the settlers live under the Israeli legal system and the local population lives under the military law. And as somebody who lived in South Africa for years before apartheid collapsed and after, uh, this is a key issue. If, if you have a, a car accident, in the West Bank between a settler and a, and a Palestinian living there. One goes to an Israeli civilian court and the other one goes to the military court. And, and this, this is exactly apartheid. You are separating the population living on the same piece of land. Legally, they're separated geographically. You have no Palestinians living inside the settlements. They are from time to time allowed to work there, but definitely not to live there. So I used to say that in the West Bank, under the occupation, you already have an apartheid system. Not to speak, apartheid today is not necessarily the South African apartheid. Apartheid is institutionalized uh, uh, discrimination, institutionalized discrimination. When you dis discriminate in a, in a, by the state, this is apartheid. It doesn't have to be that a minority is ruling the majority, like we have in South Africa, like we had in South Africa. But in the settlements, in the West Bank, this is also true, that a minority of Jews, that are about 15% of the overall population, is in fact running the lives of the rest backed by the Israeli government. So uh, Benjamin Pogrom always used to say, Israel is not apartheid and I agree with, agreed with him about the uh, situation inside the green light, in the inside the green uh, line. Right. But uh, we disagreed about occupation. Now suddenly when we speak on annexation, he jumps and says this will be apartheid. Annexation uh, in practical terms will change very little. And I'm glad that Benjamin is using the term apartheid now. Very glad about it, but, but it's too late and, uh, and it, it should have done it long ago. And uh, unfortunately, it didn't do it. Now we are in the, on the same page and we both agree that annexation at least will bring it to an apartheid situation. And I've, I, I think it's not only Benjamin, it's not only Benjamin. And here it's very important to notice that suddenly this annexation issue is bringing a big part of the Jewish world to oppose it. And occupation was a word that most of the Jews didn't want even to, you, to, to mention. And when we said occupation, they said, no, no, it's no, no occupation and so on. So I think something very interesting is happening with annexation. People realize, maybe for the first time, many of them, that the way the continuation of occupation is annexation and the continuation of annexation is apartheid and this is unavoidable. And this is the reason that, um, a big part of the Jewish world 
start standing now against the, the annexation and against what happening. And I think what ben, the change in Benjamin's position and Benjamin was used, used unfortunately, I was very sad to see by the Israeli propaganda all the time because a guy who was close to Mandela says no mm -hmm. apartheid. And now I'm glad to see him joining uh, using this terrible A word in the Israeli context. And, and I think he's not alone. And one of the things that will happen if we will have an accession, and I hope we will not have, is that this word, the A word, the terrible A word, apartheid, will be used by a much wider circle in the Jewish world and in the world as a whole. Uh, Nora, can I add a couple of words if you allow me? Yes, certainly. Go ahead. I, excuse me, before you do, I just want to say that we're not going to end at 1.30 because we started considerably late because of technolo technological difficulties. So I'm going to extend this conversation for another 10 minutes and then we'll take questions and answers from the audience, okay? Go ahead, Mohammed. Okay, okay so uh, a couple of the quick uh, comments. Uh, first of all, I think what we're exper experimenting right now is a, a battle between two theories. One is the theory of shared society inside Israel, mm -hmm. where the struggle is to uh, create social, economic, and political equality, uh, which is the model that uh, Givat Khabiva, the New Israel Fund, all of the progressive institutions have been promoting over the last uh, few years and with significant successes. And the last uh, uh, few years have shown, uh, one, that we can at least create uh, significant progress in the academic arena so that the percentage of Arab students in Israeli universities increased from 3% to 18%. In the medical industry, the percentage of Arab doctors has become 23% of Israeli doctors in Israeli hospitals, 55% of the pharmacists in Israel are Arab pharmacists. Uh, uh, the percentage of Arab citizens in the high-tech industry increased from 2% uh, uh, six years ago to 7% today. And the percentage of Arab students in the high-tech schools in Israel are 21% of the high-tech schools. So we have a movement, a massive, huge movement, which is mostly on the economic arena of positive, uh, 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 dynamics between Jews and Arabs, despite the nation state law, which leads uh, uh, Jewish Arab relations or tries uh, uh, to bring Jewish Arab relations uh, to the edge of uh, uh, collapse. And despite that, they're not succeeding. I mean, the nation state law alone, uh, many people in our community call it uh, Jude Judea height, not apartheid, but Judea height. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a Jewish new, uh, type of, of approach where it sees Jewish people as an elite race. So we don't need to import from, uh, uh, not from uh, South Africa or any other country. Uh, so that, that's one comment. The second, uh, that's one uh, dynamic that was happening. And, and, and I, I say didn't speak about Israel, Muhammad. I spoke about the West Bank. I know, I know, I know. The second comment is that while we're doing this in Israel, we're experiencing a, a settlers movement that is trying to take over Palestinian land, settling in the heart of Hebron and in the heart of the Kaspa in uh, Nablus and in all kinds of sporadic type of uh, settlement that later becomes legitimized by, by the state uh, where they do see themselves as an elite race uh, de facto because they are under military administration. So there is, as Alon said, different rules, different legal system, different political system. And uh, uh, what Israel's right is trying to do is to import their, this, their Jewish-Palestinian relations in the West Bank and to also bring it inside Israel, uh, you know, to make it uh, one size fits all. And uh, they're, they're realizing that they have maybe this uh, golden moment with uh, Trump in the White House to allow them uh, mm -hmm. uh, to go that extra mile, right. uh, one, one to answer the, maybe the personal wishes and wills, will, uh, personal interests of Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, but the extreme right is milking Netanyahu to the last drop 
and Absolutely. he's willingly is willingly giving it because he wants to go into history as someone that has done something, even if it is that bad, but it's better than being. He's uh, done something. Bad. He's he, done. Yeah, something. He wants to basically uh, bring a different picture than being the first one that has gone to jail with corruption charges and things like that. Definitely. Uh, thank you, Mohammed. Alon, I'd like to ask you a couple more questions since our time is short and you came along uh, just recently. Um, there have been objections to this annexation, uh, not only obviously within Israel, but in the international arena. Uh, for example, Germany's foreign minister recently made a special trip to Israel to express his country's concerns. Jordan has warned it could rethink its peace treaty with Israel. Joe Biden, the Democratic candidate for the US presidency, has warned against proceeding with this annexation. What do you think the impact of annexation will be internationally, for example, on British, France, Germany, Jordan, the USA, and also on the International Criminal Court, the ICC? It's a huge question, I know, but okay. do your best. So, so first, Israel, Israel has decided to annex. We have a coalition agreement between Netanyahu and Benny Gantz, who is now Minister of Defense, that Israel will annex starting July 1st in two weeks. So all the question of how much support there is inside Israel is irrelevant. We don't have elections ahead of us. We just had elections not long ago, and this was the result, and Israel already has decided. Also, part of the Israeli opposition supports annexation. Don't forget that uh, Lieberman is in the opposition and also Lapid, yeah. Yeshatid, is not against the annexation. So you hardly, you hardly have Jewish opposition to the annexation. There are worries about the price. There are worries about the price. And Netanyahu, the right wing, they don't care about the price. They are even ready to pay the price of becoming an apartheid state. They are not worried about it. Part of the coalition is worried about the collapse of the peace process with Jordan and maybe with Egypt. And they want the annexation. They want to annex the territory. They want the territory, but they are afraid to pay a price that is not worth it, let's say. So Israel, in fact, has decided some do it willingly and some do it reluctantly with worries, but it's in the pipeline. Israel is going to do it. The only way to stop it is the international community. The only way. And by the way, in the past, international community didn't stop Israel from doing anything. Yeah, right. But now it might be different. It might be different, first of all, because of Jordan. First of all, the relations with Jordan are extremely important to Israel. First of all, security. First of all, security. If we lose Jordan, uh, security-wise, uh, the Iranians, the Iranians might be on our on the Jordan River. But another thing that is almost ignored the export of gas uh, in Israel are mostly to Jordan. We, we, we mm -hmm. hardly export any gas beside Jordan, and the deal with Jordan is crucial. We provide now all the Jordanian uh, needs in gas, and uh, if, if this deal collapses, maybe the energy companies working here will collapse. Because, because we have minimal, minimal amount of export to Egypt, and this might also not survive. And there is another problem here, that the United States is involved. The United States guaranteed the Israeli-Jordanian gas agreement by a half a billion dollars guarantees to Nobel Energy, that is the company that is supplying the gas. So, we might have a chaos in our energy market and, the, and all the gas findings that we, that we had might really get lost and, and we, we will lose uh, the possibility to export gas. So 
these are worries. These are existing worries. The question is, what will Jordan do? And if the United States has enough leverage on Jordan not to do it, but this is a question mark. The second is the ability that uh, Europe, Western Europe, or some of the countries in Western Europe will recognize Palestine as a state. This did not happen so far, and some of them are considering it. This is also frightening Israel, because most of the Israelis who do the annexation, especially the right wing, uh, do not want a Palestinian state. And here, if the annexation, if the price of the annexation will be massive recognition, massive international recognition in, in Palestine, maybe it's not worth doing it. The third thing that I think is, is Israel has to take into account, uh, and may, maybe some of the Israelis do, is that there'll be a terrible rift in the Jewish world because the, the Jewish world, as I said, the annexation is an eye opener for the Jewish world. Occupation, you could argue, was the result of a war, a defensive war. Israel was attacked, defended itself, ended up in Palestinian territory. Israel offered so many uh, peace offers that were rejected, but now we don't have as a security threat, and we go to a move of annexation that is illegal internationally no, when nobody is forcing us to do it. And in fact, we do something that will change the nature of the country, maybe for generations. So this annexation will cause not only massive opposition outside Israel in the Jewish world, especially in North America, especially in the United States, it can cause a rift that will bring about two separate Jewish people. Two separate Jewish people without any geographic meaning. Because I live in Israel, I have my house in Israel, all my family is in Israel, I don't have uh, first degree relatives outside Israel, but I, I, will, I will belong to the liberal progressive part of the Jewish world and not to the nationalistic religious part of the Jewish world. So, so the Jewish world will be torn to two people. So maybe we, the result will be one state, but two Jewish people, wow. because many of the Jewish people will say, we cannot support an apartheid state. So if you combine all these three, one, the possibility of losing Jordan, I'm not saying Egypt because I don't think this is a very shaky uh, situation with Egypt, although a Jordanian collapse might trigger a problem with Jordan. Two, Egypt, you a change in Western Europe, especially in countries like France and maybe, maybe Britain, in favor of uh, strengthening the two-state position. Three, the, the, res the response in the Jewish world. I think these are the main hesitations of blue and white, of Gantz and Ashkenazi when they, before they vote. They are forced to vote for the annexation, but they are also entitled now as Minister of Defense, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, to put the question marks, especially to the Israeli public. Mm -hmm. They cannot argue with Netanyahu because they signed that yeah. they ag will agree to the annexation already, but they can come to the Israeli public and tell them, look, at the price we are going to pay, is it worth it? Do you think they'll do that alone? Again, we have two weeks. We have two weeks. Netanyahu will start working on it on the 1st of July because he has this window, and Mohammed mentioned the window, the Trump window. Who knows for how long he has the Trump window. So he will work on it very fast. So the question is the coming two weeks. If in the coming two weeks, Jordan will speak out clearly, Egypt will speak out clearly. And we saw the Emirates, the ambassador uh, of the Emirates in Washington warning against the annexation. If that. Europe will speak out clearly, and if the Jewish world will speak out clearly, 
Gantz and Ashkenazi will stop the annexation. This is my feeling, but we have only two weeks because afterwards it's done. I was about to ask you about uh, what you think, just if you could answer quickly before we go to Q&A, Alon. Um, given the polarization in the Jewish communities around the world, and for example, JSpace constantly being um, called out for criticizing Netanyahu and how dare we and so forth, you know, what advice would you have for progressive Zionist concerned Jews in the diaspora? How, what we could do in a situation like this, or if we can have any impact at all? Yeah. Look, I will elaborate here because, because I guess that most of our viewers are uh, related to JSpace. Uh, you know, I left the government years ago. I was 30 years in the middle of the mainstream of Israel, mm -hmm. uh, ambassador in different countries and so on. But since I left the government and started criticizing the occupation, I was marginalized with many of my friends and often, often, especially when we called for a recognition of a Palestinian state, we felt very isolated in the Jewish world and especially when we were speaking about the occupation. And, and now it's very different. We are not isolated anymore. Mm -hmm. we, we, we are not embraced by the right wing but the opposition to, to the annexation goes from human rights activists or, or peace activists like myself to the middle, to the middle of the politic, Jewish political map. And we see rabbis, rabbis of different kinds, reform rabbis, but even conservative rabbis coming to us and saying fight against the annexation. In the last 10 years, when we were so marginalized, the Israeli peace camp, and shrunk to, to uh, almost nothing, suddenly now people say, raise your voice, do something, we must save the country and so on. So what, I, what I'm saying is that, that the, the Jewish world should treat this move as a move that is irreversible, irreversible. If Israel is annexing, this will change the country and the Jewish world for generations to come. There is no way any Israeli government will be able to reverse it if the government in July will confirm it almost unanimously and if the parliament will vote with 75 or 80 members of parliament, there is no way to reverse it and the Israel you knew will not exist anymore. You'll have a different Israel. So this is the reason it is so important that in the Jewish communities, people will wake up, will wake up and search not for the uh, usual suspects like, like me, but search for the middle. Search even for the reasonable human rights activists and supporters in the, in the Jewish uh, hardcore that will be with you this time, and this, will, this can make a difference. Thank you. I think we're going to now take a few questions. Thank you both. Your comments have both been amazing. Uh, we have many, many questions, and I think only about seven minutes. Um, so I'm going through um, many, many, and I'm going to just pick a couple. Um, a question to Mohammed uh, from Deta Campagnano. Mohammed, do you see any option um, on the part of Abbas to come and propose in the next week or so to begin some kind of negotiation with Israel to, to cause a um, to put the brakes on, on Bibi, on Netanyahu's plan? Well, I think it's feasible, but Abbas will not do that unless he's backed with the European uh, Union, with the Europeans, and maybe the uh, Russians and uh, the Arab League. 
so I don't think it's only his call. I don't think he has an interest in uh, a unilateral uh, type of action, uh, which might be seen by the Palestinians as uh, basically giving in uh, to the Israeli might and power that is uh, scaring him and uh, him coming to this kind of negotiated uh, approach or negotiated strategy uh, in front of the aggressive strategy that Israel is doing. So he will look very weak in the eyes of the Palestinians, which definitely is not in his interest, unless, as I said, he has the backing of uh, three of the quartet partners uh, or a couple of the quartet partners, mm -hmm. uh, Russia, uh, European Union, and definitely he, he will need the backing of the Arab world. But if he does it on his own, that will be seen as a desperate, uh, bad movement expressing his weakness. I mean, he is weak, definitely, but he doesn't need to declare weakness by saying, okay, you come to take my land, I offer my hand to you for negotiations. This will be seen by the Palestinian public uh, as weakness. And I think this might uh, add to the efforts to delegitimize him within the Palestinian community, which is counterproductive at this time, at this moment. At this moment, what is needed for the Palestinians is some kind of uh, unity and not uh, more divisive st actions that uh, might be taken like this by Abbas. Thank you. Uh, the last question I'll, I'll uh, present to Alon. There are several questions along the same lines. Uh, for ex about the legal basis for this. Would annexation still require support from the Knesset by a parliamentary process before commencing? If so, what does that look like? What is the legal procedure for annexation? Does it require a cabinet vote, a Knesset vote? Uh, all that sort of thing. What, what is necessary for this to go forward, legally speaking, uh, procedurally speaking? People seem confused about that. I'm not sure I got the question, but I'll try, I'll do my best. First, about uh, the Palestinians entering negotiations. You know, since I left the government, I'm teaching conflict resolution. And the first thing you tell the students that if you have a mediator, it has to be balanced. The last thing you can say about President Trump is that he's balanced between Israel and the <laughs> Palestinians. And, and why should the Palestinians go into and negotiations when, when the mediator is Trump and when the plan that he presented is an Israeli plan, is, is, is something that Israel asked him to do. So it, it, I, I, I'm surprised even about the question, why should the Palestinian enter negotiations at this stage uh, with, with such a plan and with such a, a mediator? Regarding the annexation, I'm not, I'm not sure I understood the full question, but uh, the stages are yeah. that 1st of July, Netanyahu brings it to the cabinet. Mm -hmm. He will have a unanimous support in the cabinet. I think 5th of July, he brings it to the government. We have, if I'm not wrong, who is counting 35 ministers only two might vote against. So, he, and then he has to go to the Knesset. Then he has to go to the Knesset. And in the Knesset, the question is, if the annexation will mention the Trump plan or not. If the annexation will not mention the Trump plan, you get the support of the right-wingers, even opposition right-wingers. Mm -hmm. But if it will mention the Trump plan, then you don't get the support of, of the right wing. So the question, the, the issue to follow now is if Israel is annexing on its own without the Trump plan in the background, or if it's annexing as part of the Trump plan. Why? Because the Trump plan means or mentions a Palestinian state. Exactly. And most of the Israelis, probably, as it seems now, do not want a Palestinian state. So the issue to follow on the Knesset vote is what is the wording. 
And I still believe that this government that is a quite a white government, white government in Israeli terms, will get the Knesset support. And this is, this is what will matter. If, the, if there is a massive Knesset support, this is irreversible. Well, on this somber, but I think, again, accurate note, um, I'm, I, want, I need to wrap up because, we, because of the timing. Unfortunately, I feel like we could go on and on. And that I have personally a whole bunch of questions I'd like to ask both of you. But first of all, thank you so much, Mohammed and Alon, for your knowledge, your insights, your thought-provoking comments. You've added so much to my understanding, and I'm sure to our listeners, you've given us a great deal to think about and mull over as we watch how things unfold in the coming weeks. Um, I also want to thank all of you who joined us today for tonight, depending on where you are, for this webinar. And to remind you that each one of us can make a real difference to help promote and sustain the kind of Israel that we love and want to preserve. Please explore the organizations that Alon and Mohammed are so involved with, the Center for Shared Society at Givar Chaviva, CISO, Save Israel, Stop the Occupation, and J-Link, the International Progressive Jewish Network. These are very important initiatives that deserve all of our support. And if you are not yet a member of JSpace, I urge you to join us and support us as well, so that all together we can work now and for the future for a just and peaceful Israel. Thank you all. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.